Welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. This series is presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in partnership with UC Irvine Health. The idea for this was conceived several years ago in the office of the late Dr. Steinert, the founding director of UCI's Herbert Gavin Eye Clinic, and Mike and Polly Smith. Mike and Polly have been our steadfast sponsors annually, and we are truly grateful for them for doing this for us. This is especially fond to me because I happen to have the privilege of being at that meeting when this was founded. So this is a very special series. My name is Adrian Windsor. I am a member of the board of the foundation where I serve as chair of our development committee. I'm bringing this up because development is challenging right now. And our foundation is membership sponsored. If you are a member, we thank you. If your membership is up for renewal, we're counting on you. And if you are not a member, we hope you'll go to our website and join. The foundation provides services and programs for the library outside of the city's budget for the library. And our wonderful Library Live and Witty Lecture Series will be re beginning again virtually in January, and we want you to be with us. Now, before I introduce our speaker, allow me to present our program schedule. Dr. Cesario will speak approximately 25 to 30 minutes. This will be followed by Q&A. Please hold all of your questions until the end. And you may submit your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen instead of the chat box. This event is recorded and will be available to watch on the Library Foundation's YouTube channel. Now, I am pleased to introduce the second speaker in our Virtual Medicine in Our Backyard Series 2020-21, Dr. Thomas Cesario. Dr. Cesario is an Emeritus Professor of Medicine at the University of California, Irvine, where he served at the, as the Dean of the Medical School for 12 years. He is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin and the University of Wisconsin Medical School and has led a distinguished career in the field of internal medicine and infectious diseases, publishing over 115 peer-reviewed papers. He has served on national committees for granting agencies, including the University of California AIDS Task Force, the NIH and the Veterans Administration, as well as spending eight years on the board of the National Residency Match Program, including one year as its president. He is a master of the American College of Physicians and a fellow of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Dr. Cesario has been appointed clinical advisor to the UC Health Coordinating Center for COVID-19. He speaks to us today about a subject close to each of our lives, COVID-19. Welcome, Dr. Thomas Cesario. Thank you, Adrian. I'm very pleased to be here today, and I'm glad to have an opportunity to talk to you about COVID. I begin by telling you I have a no commercial biases, and the opinions I express here are, are my own. Let me begin by giving a little introduction to uh, viruses. Uh, viruses are very small particles that contain only a few genes. They express a number of proteins, but they don't have enough genes or proteins to allow them to exist independently, such as bacteria do on an agar plate. So they have to parasitize cells in order to reproduce. In the world at large, we know there are about 62,000 different vertebrate species. And in those species, there are probably 3 million or uh, uh, different virus types known to infect vertebrate animals. But that infection process is very specific. The virus has got to attach to a very specific receptor in a cell in order to begin the process of invasion and reproduction, very much like a lock and the key. If the virus doesn't have the right key, it can't open the block and it cannot therefore produce infection. That's why the vast majority of these viruses that exist in different species can never infect man because we don't have the receptor that allows them to attach. If the virus can attach and begins the process of reproduction, then it can either destroy or damage the cell interfering with its function, or it can become dormant, a process we call latency. 
And in so doing, if the cells are damaged or destroyed, we get inflammation and we can get disease. Now, how does that apply to this specific virus? Well, we know this virus was first seen in China in uh, November of last year. Uh, we believe that uh, this case probably uh, was the result of a bat virus uh, that was able to mutate or recombine in an intermediary species of animals, and in so doing, adapt its protein to be able to attach to a human receptor, that it was able to change the key enough that it could find a lock in the human receptor system, and in so doing, produce disease. Now, the virus itself is, is not an unusual virus. It's like a lot of other viruses. Its genes are made up of ribonucleic acid. Uh, it has only a few structural genes, but one of which is very important to us is the so-called spike. The spike is like a protrusion from the surface of the virus that allows that virus to find and attach itself to the receptor in the human respiratory tract that we call angiotensin converting enzyme two. That's the specific interaction between the key and the lock. That spike is important to us because if we develop antibodies to that spike, we think we can neutralize the, vi the virus and either prevent disease or modify the course of it. We fully understand, at least to a large extent, how the virus enters the cell and reproduces itself. And this is important to us because as we study each of these steps, we find ways to interrupt the process and in so doing essentially kill the virus and stop the disease process. The virus, like many viruses, including influenza, can change over time. Uh, it, this particular virus seems to have changed rather slowly since we have discovered the virus a year ago probably only one significant change has been noted, that in the nature of that spike protein, and that probably has made the virus a little more infectious, at least as studied in tissue culture. We don't completely know the consequences of that change yet in humans. What I wanna talk about is how does a virus produce infection? Just like with a medicine, in order to produce disease, the virus has to have a certain dose. And dose in this case is how many live virus particles it has to enter your body and attach itself to the receptor. We don't actually know for this virus, but drawing parallels from the other two pathogenic viruses that we've had as variants of, of the coronaviruses in the last 20 years, it's probably somewhere between 100 and 1,000 viral particles that have to enter your body and find the receptor and attach. So keep that number in the back of your mind. Why is that number important? That number is important because as we cough or as we sneeze or even talk loudly or sing, perhaps even laugh, we propel into the environment a number of particles. Many of those particles are little fluid-filled droplets. If we happen to be infected, those fluid-filled droplets can contain anywhere from 100 to 10,000 viral particles. Now, remember what I told you about the infectious dose. Now, if the particles are large and fluid-filled, they typically will fall to the ground within three feet. On the other hand, some of those live virus particles are contained in very small particles, or they may dry out. And if that's the case, they can go farther than three feet, which the larger particles usually cannot. Furthermore, as those particles are propelled into the environment, some of them can remain suspended for even periods up to an hour. So if we look at what determines infectivity, that is what determines if you're going to get that number of virus particles necessary to produce infection, it will depend upon the person who is infected, how much of the virus they propel into the environment, how far they propel it, depending upon how loud they talk or sing or cough. It will also depend upon how long you stay in that environment, 
and it will depend upon how far you are from the person who is propelling that virus into the environment. So it's a matter of probabilities. The closer you are to the infected person, the more likely you are to get infected. The farther you are, the less likely you are to get infected. So we know with this virus that most of the really infectious virus particles will only go three feet or more. So we say droplets are the key way that this virus is transmitted, meaning particles of five microns or larger. However, we do say six feet is probably an effective distance for the majority of cases. We know that if you're outside and the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, those particles disperse faster and you're less likely to get the critical number. If you're in a small room with poor ventilation, the easier it is to come in contact with a critical number of virus particles. We know the virus is easily inactivated. It's inactivated by alcohol, by hydrogen peroxide, and the best household disinfectant we have is dilute bleach. Five tablespoons in a gallon of water usually will kill many viruses, but certainly this virus within a minute. But we also know simple washing hands with soap and water for 20 seconds or so will also remove the virus and make it less infectious. If the virus is propelled in the environment and settles out onto surfaces, depending on the nature of the surface, it can last for up to two or three days. The surfaces that are most apt to harbor the virus tend to be things like stainless steel or plastic. The other question is, when is a person who has the virus really infectious? When are they propelling those particles out into the environment that contain the virus? And that is determined by how we actually grow the virus. We have to actually be able to grow the virus to be able to determine a person's infectivity. And we know if a person gets the infected, that typically they will be infectious from about two days before they get sick until about eight to 10 days after the onset of illness. That's the period of peak infectivity. There are cases where people have, are immune suppressed because of medicines or because they have a serious underlying disease where that period can be longer, but typically it's up to 10 days. How does this translate? What we say is that if a person gets infected, they are likely to transfer that infection to two to three other people, average of two and a half. But each of those people will transmit it to another two and a half, and those to another two and a half. And that's how the virus is propelled into the environment. If we look at a household of somebody who comes in with the virus, not taking any precaution, people living in that household have about a 15 to 30% chance that they will get the virus themselves. And if you are working around that person that is in close contact, typically uh, some activity that brings you in contact for a, a longer period of time, uh, uh, you have about a 10% chance of getting that virus from that person. Now, we know that people who are actively infected excrete that virus into the environment, and we know the time period from those who are symptomatic. But what we have learned in the last few months is that many people actually can become infectious and never realize they are sick. And that can happen in some cases because they never get sick and still can be infectious or because they are in the pre-symptomatic period. That is, they were infectious for two or three days before they actually get the illness itself. How infectious are people? Is it dependent upon age? Well, what we have found from a number of studies, and we being not me, but the infectious disease community as a large, is that younger children under the age of 10 seem to be less likely to transmit it. But once they get to be 10 and older, they appear to be equally able to transmit the virus to other people. And these are the references for that. Now, there are certain circumstances 
where people seem to be particularly apt to spread the virus. And we call those super spreaders. And that particularly is going to occur when a person is in a room with poor ventilation and the room is small and you get an individual who enters the room who's infectious, whether they know it or not, and are then expelling the virus into the environment. And these are situations largely of family meals where you can see eight or so people were exposed, eight got infected. But the idea of all this is that a number of people exposed to the individual got infected. And we have special events where many people got infected from a single individual. The best example of that is the Skagit Valley Choir in Mount, Wash Mount Vernon, Washington, where a choir practice was scheduled one night and a person trying to make an extra effort to participate came in coming down with what they thought was a cold and over two and a half hours of choral practice with a few breaks in between for coffee and for snacks, that person was able to infect 52 of the 60 members of the choir, including three that had to go to the hospital and two deaths. That's what we call super spreaders. We've seen that on cruise ships, the Diamond Princess that you all know about, two aircraft carriers, one US, one French, same type of spread. And we had a case in Germany where probably just before Lent, uh, there was uh, a carnival that came to town. Uh, there was a major feast uh, that happened. Somebody introduced the virus during that feast where there was a lot of hugging and a lot of kissing, a lot of laughing, a lot of, of probably beer, alcoholic beverages, and people were infected, brought it home to their families. And before it was over, 15% of the people in that community were infected. Now, there are things you can do to interrupt that spread. So I've told you before about the critical number of particles and how the virus is propelled in the environment, but you can do something to stop it. We talked about the criteria. So one of those is distance. The farther you are, the less likely to get the critical numbers. We know masks are definitely effective. They're most effective if the person who is infected, who is, infected is worrying them trapping those virus particles before they get out in the environment. But we also know that the recipient benefits from wearing a mask. So while masks are not perfect, they certainly help to reduce your risk. We know you can acquire the virus from the environment. If the virus is deposited on those surfaces and you touch those surfaces, acquire the critical number, and you rub your cheeks, or your, I'm sorry, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, you can introduce enough virus particles to become infected. So we say don't touch and wash. Cough etiquette, using your handkerchief to cough into, using your elbow to cough into is important. But also important to us is finding people who are spreading the virus or who are about to spread the virus before they get sick and quarantining them so we keep them out of the population so we reduce the spread. And I point out that our goal is to do this until we get the vaccine. What we're trying to do is buy time by keeping the number of infections down until we can actively do something to prevent the infection. Now, this is the, a few of the references for masks. What happens when a person gets sick? Typically, it takes about five days to actually get ill. And then they come down with anything from no illness to a cold to a bad cough to pneumonia that brings them into the hospital. Those that come to medical attention typically have fever, cough, and for adults, shortness of breath. Cannot distinguish this from influenza, from a number of the other respiratory illnesses until you do a diagnostic test. There are a few other things like sore throat, fatigue, etc and special things like a loss of taste and smell that can happen particularly with this virus, but also with other respiratory viruses. What I wanna point out is that if you do get sick, the key thing is that the disease progresses day by day and the worst part of the disease is typically on the eighth or ninth day. And people who get in trouble 
with bad pneumonia get in trouble on the onset of the second week. That's the key part. Of those that come to our attention, about three quarters have mild disease. Now mild disease still means bad cough, mild disease still means pneumonia, it just means you didn't end up in the intensive care unit. Of those who come to our attention, about a quarter are sick enough to actually have to go to the intensive care unit, and probably now our numbers are a little better than that. If you have to go to the intensive care unit, about a third of them end up having to go on mechanical ventilation. That is, we have to breathe for them, and a fraction of those actually go on an artificial lung, extracorporeal membrane oxygenator. And if you get to that stage, that's when really the body begins to fail. And that's when the heart problems occur, shock happens, kidneys start to fail, and a number of other events happen that make it likely uh, that you have a much higher risk of death. Overall, in the US, the mortality rate is about 2.5% of those patients we know about. But what I tell everybody, remember that for every case that we know about, there are five cases we don't know about. So if you want to know what actually happens, you could probably divide these statistics by five, and that would give you a clue of actually what happens to people overall. Children appear to get less sick. I told you when they get to be 10, however, they are as infectious as others. There are unique syndromes that happen in children. We have this multisystem inflammatory disease uh, that uh, has uh, occurred in a, over a thousand children in the US. Those children almost all end up in the hospital probably half of them in the intensive care unit, but we've learned how to deal with them, so the mortality rate is low. But there are still deaths that happen in children. We can talk about what the, um, what the mortality rate is and why children get less. This is the picture of a CAT scan of a person with pneumonia, and where the arrows are, you can see what pneumonia looks like in the lung. The black dotted areas are what lungs are supposed to look like, not the white areas where that is a combination of inflammatory cells and fluid filling up the lung. What are the risk factors for serious disease? Particularly age is critical, but underlying disease, and remember 50% of the population has some underlying disease, whether it's hypertension or a prior history of some heart problems or diabetes or other comorbidities. But age and underlying disease are risk factors for more serious disease. Now, once you get the infection, your body starts to fight it. Your body fights it by mounting an immune response. And that immune response and the virus results in a certain degree of inflammation. If you can't control that inflammation, you go on to have all the bad consequences I talked about. But if your immune system is able to control it and abort that inflammatory process from occurring, or at least to a significant degree, then it is likely that you will recover and do well. That immunity is both antibody and mediated by cells that are able to find and destroy the virus. And these are a few of the references that talk to that uh, process of immunity. How do we diagnose this? Well, typically we diagnose this with a nasal swab that detects the viral genes. What's important is that does not tell you whether you are infectious. It tells you whether you've been infected, but it doesn't tell you you are infectious because it doesn't tell us about live viruses. That test is usually positive for 15 to 20 days after you begin to get ill, but it can be positive for months. And that's why we say if a person has a positive test, you shouldn't repeat it for 90 days because maybe just dealing with leftover viral particles that are no longer infectious. The tests that we use are, have not been well standardized and approved because of the emergency. They have all been given authorization on a limited basis. And so they represent a potpourri of, of really uh, of tests developed by individual institutions. We don't do viral cultures because there's, it's, they're time consuming and they're somewhat dangerous to do. 
and most uh, institutions just don't have the facility to do that. We also have antibody tests. The antibody tests tell us whether you have been infected at some time. They don't tell us whether you are infected now. Now we are working on rapid tests. There literally are going to be tests. Abbott has the uh, Abbott Now test, which literally is a test that you drop a little drop of fluid from your secretions onto a, 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 a what, what amounts to a piece of paper, and you get a reading in 15 minutes whether you're infected or not. Uh, those tests are being approved. They look like they are reasonably sensitive and probably reasonably specific. Sensitive being 80% of the time they will be right. Uh, those will be available now for, uh, are, are available, but they're very in the process of, of being distributed uh, to places like uh, nursing homes where they need them a lot. The other question is, we have had this disease here for almost a year, probably now approaching at least 10 months. How many people have actually had the virus? As far as we can tell in the US, the average is five to 10%. In places like the East Coast, particularly the Northeast, where they had a major pandemic outbreak a few months ago, in some places that is 20 or 30 percent of the people are positive. But we have places here out in the West and in California where that incidence is two or three percent. But overall, and that's true of California, it's probably about five to 10 percent of the people have been infected, which means 90 percent are still susceptible. Can you get it again? And the answer is yes, you can. We have had a few cases who have gotten it again. We know that the other coronaviruses that we've had beforehand are viruses that are capable of repeated infection. What we tend to think, and I believe, is the worst infection will be the first. When you get it the first time, that's when the risk is graded, greatest. And when you get it again, the likelihood is the disease will be milder. We don't know that for a fact, but that looks like it might be the case. But we already have been able to show there are a small number of cases who even within a couple of months, two to three months after the first infection, have clearly gotten a second infection with the same virus. What can we do about it? Well, it's not a lot. We have learned over time to take a better care of these patients, but we only have a couple things that are effective. Remdesivir, should be M, remdesivir, actually is the one agent that's antiviral. It blocks the virus's uh, enzyme that copies the genes, but it's not a wonder drug. There has not been, to my knowledge, any study that has shown remdesivir improves mortality. The studies that have been relied on to allow for its approval have shown that it accelerates the rate of recovery short by a, couple, by a few days, up to four days. On the other hand, I told you before that the immune system, as it battles the virus, ends up with a severe inflammatory reaction. And when that inflammatory reaction is not controlled, patients develop the complications. So if you use dexamethasone, which is a very powerful steroid, the most powerful cortisone that we have, and you time it just right, that is just when the person is getting, having trouble breathing, when their oxygen level falls, you can then begin to reduce that inflammation, and that does result in somewhat of an improvement in mortality. It's not a cure-all, but it probably reduces mortality by something in the range of 25 to 30%. We're looking for things in the future. Among those are monoclonal antibodies and convalescent plasma. Convalescent plasma means you take the plasma from somebody who's had the disease and you give that plasma to somebody who is struggling. Those studies are ongoing. They haven't produced any dramatic results so far, but we're still looking to see if that works. In the meantime, people have said, well, look, we're giving a whole potpourri of antibodies. Why don't we give specific antibodies? Let's give the best antibodies and let's find a way to produce them in the laboratory and give them to people. And that's what these studies, are, what these uh, uh, companies are all doing. They're producing monoclonal antibodies specific to components, particularly 
the receptor binding portion of the, of the spike protein. And we're looking to see whether it works. That's what the president got a couple of uh, weeks back here was one of these monoclonal antibodies. We're looking to see whether they in fact will work and work effectively. But the big story of course is prevention. We're all tired of dealing with this. And so can we prevent it? So there are over actually now 200 vaccine candidates at some stage in preparation. And remember we do a primary uh, phase in which we look to see whether the vaccine will induce an antibody response at all. And we get some idea of what the dose might be. The second phase, we get some idea of whether or not we can actually produce neutralizing antibody. The first stage is usually less than 100 patients. The second phase is usually a few hundred patients. And the third phase is whether it actually will prevent or alter the course of disease in the general population. And that has to take 30 to 40,000 patients to determine. So the vaccines that we have are come in six different categories. One are the viral genes themselves, which can be prepared in such a way they can be given to people. And then the people will accept that viral gene it's introduced into the muscle cells, which copy the protein, which is then given to your immune system to prepare the immune system to, to make antibodies. Uh, there are two major uh, manufacturers who are in the final phases of that testing that you see here, ones with stars, the others are, are not as far along in the process. You can also take a, a virus and genetically you can modify it so that rather than looking like the original virus, it fools the body into thinking that it's the coronavirus. And you then can give that to people in an attempt to get the body to induce immunity. And there are a number of companies that have done that. And we can, if we want to get into that later on, the ones that are most important to us are the Oxford vaccine and Johnson and Johnson. Uh, but the Chinese vaccine that you've heard about and the Russian vaccine that they have announced are basically based upon that type of strategy. Uh, you can also take just the spike protein and purify it in the lab and give that to people. And that also will induce an antibody response. And that's what Novavax and Sanofi have done. And those that are now also entering the final stages of testing. Or you can do what we traditionally have done. You take the virus, a whole virus, and you inactivate it, typically with a chemical, and you give the inactivated virus to people. And those are being done. So right now, what we can tell you is the vaccines look like they induce neutralizing antibody. We're waiting to see whether they actually are infected. So what's happened up to now? Well, I told you before, the overall mortality rate of those people we know have it is about two and a half percent in the US, but clearly 80% are in people 65 and older. That's the biggest risk group. But I always remind people that's the biggest risk group, but a substantial number now, probably at, at this point in time, since this is an older graph, about 20% of those cases occur in people younger than 65. And we now have had deaths even in young children. So it can affect any. So risking getting this infection still risks serious disease. And we also know that up to 50% of the people who recover have some consequence, extended fatigue, difficulty concentrating, or other problems we think are directly related to the virus. So this is not a good virus to get. It's one we want you to try to avoid, and we want to do something to see if we can't bring this pandemic to a halt. And so with that, we'll go into the questions. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Cesario. You said that you were condensing a day's lectures into half an hour. So we really appreciate what you've done for us this afternoon. It sounds like the best thing we can do is stay home <laughs> and stay away from people. We have a few questions here. Uh, one is asking, do patients who are sick a long time, several weeks, only stay contagious for about 10 days? And the answer to that is generally yes. Um, the vast majority of stay infectious only for 10 days, with the exception of those people who have serious underlying disease, uh, like cancer or uh, some of the patients uh, with rheumatologic diseases, getting some of these potent immune suppressing agents like the TNF inhibitors, Embril, uh, things of that sort, or patients who end up in the ICU. Those patients can have an, a, a longer period of infectivity for others up to, uh, I think the longest I've seen is 18 days, but we say up to 20 days. But the vast majority of people will no longer be infectious after, the, after 10 days. Now, what about asymptomatic people who spread the disease? If they don't sneeze or they don't cough, how do they spread it? Well, because talking, laughing, singing, all propel things into the environment. If you talk loudly, like I'm doing now, uh, you introduce those particles out into the environment. And you start to shout, they go farther and farther and farther. And that's how they spread the virus. All right, now we have vaccine-related questions. Uh, one, historically, there have never been effective vaccines for many viruses. Why is there such a hope for COVID-19? And as part of that, since this has been developed with such a warp speed, uh, how safe can we feel that the vaccine will be when it's available? Well, uh, two things. Uh, one is, uh, you are right, uh, we, we, there, are vac there are viruses that we haven't had vaccines for, uh, although I would say in most cases where we've really tried to produce the vaccine, we have been able to do that. Uh, and things like measles, chickenpox, influenza, mumps, uh, rubella, for example, uh, smallpox. So we, we, we have the technology to be able to do that. And so I think we've learned uh, well that we can do, we have the technology to do it. And we have the virus, which is the, the key thing. We know how to grow the virus and we know the components of the virus that induce the immune response and we know how to neutralize those. Now, the difficulty, or I say the difference this time is we are producing the vaccines faster than we have ever done it before. We're producing this in months. And in the past, it's taken 10 years to develop a vaccine. So warp speed is, is literally a cosmic uh, in this, the rapidity with which it's being developed. And furthermore, some of the vaccines like the Moderna one and the Pfizer one, we're using technology that has been used only in limited situations like Ebola virus. It's worked against Ebola virus in a few thousand patients, the technology, but it has not been applied to what will be millions of patients in the US and other parts of the world. So that technology is new. The other technologies are technologies uh, that we have used before and we have some familiarity with. Now, the other thing is what about its safety? Well, we have enough data now from the phase one, phase two, and early phase three to believe that, there, that the vaccine is relatively safe. Uh, that is, that probably there are no catastrophic widespread complications that will happen. What, what we don't know, and we don't know that until we give it to thousands of people, is what about rare and unusual complications? What about the one in a thousand complications? That's what we have to discover uh, when we give it to 30 to 40,000 people, because it may be that we will see things then that we don't see now, or we may see things that are unique to certain people or certain populations. So the safety question is still relatively unanswered, particularly as it applies to masses of people. Wow, okay. Uh, now, I have a question here about the impact on the economy, the pressure to open up. Uh, what is 
what is your attitude toward lockdown or do you have one? I, I know you don't want to politicize this. Yeah. Well, here's, I, I, I am very sensitive to the issue of the economy. Uh, and I'm going to tell you two things. I do not think, first of all, the economy can recover completely until we get this recover, until we get this pandemic solved. Because there always are going to be start and stops every time this breaks out in a new place. So we have to get this controlled. Second thing I think is the decisions as to things, and I, I don't like to use a lockdown, but I'm going to use that, has to be local. That is to say, there's no reason to do this all over the country if it's only breaking out in one place or two places or five places. That's where you have to consider lockdown. Secondly, I think lockdown is relative. There are certain places where we know the virus spreads readily. Bars are a big problem for us. Remember I told you about small rooms. Well, you get small rooms with a lot of people and you're gonna spread the virus. Somebody's gonna walk into those rooms, either is asymptomatic, mildly ill, whatever it is, and that person is gonna be the match that lights the, that's gonna cause the explosion. So we know those places are places where we have to be particularly cautious of. We know we can't have a large number of people all sitting next to each other. If you violate that six foot rule, particularly sitting next to them within three feet, you are gonna spread the virus. And remember that you spread the virus, but the people you spread it to, they spread it, and so on down the line. So we have to do things locally when we know the virus is present in large numbers to control it, and we do the obvious thing, no crowds, no rooms with a lot of people tied together. Then I think we have, we have to work smart. We cannot keep people away from work, but we can tell them, look, when you go to work, if you're gonna work around people, you ought to wear a mask. We don't want you to infect anybody else and we want, don't want them to affect you. And you ought to keep your distance. And remember, it's also, it's time and distance and the, and the infectivity of the other person. So if you work smart and you keep your distance as best you can, you limit the amount of contact with other people, you wear a mask, you reduce the chance you are spreading it, and then yes, we have to go back to work. But remember, we're doing this until we get the vaccine. We're not doing this forever, but I will tell you that all of us believe that the first vaccines to be licensed are not gonna be the most effective. So we're going to tell people that even when we get the vaccine, well, that will get us from here to there. We were still going to want to be very cautious because we're still going to worry the vaccine is out there. And we still know there are people who are not going to take the vaccine. And what I hear you saying is there's a high level of personal responsibility for being safe, that we, we have to take this upon ourselves. Adrian, I could not have said it better. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cesario, for presenting to us this afternoon. Uh, I thank you, and I thank UCI Health. I want to remind our participants that this is recorded, and you will have a link to it. You can share it with your friends. And also to tell you that if you have questions that Dr. Cesario didn't answer, you can Contact us at programs at nbplfoundation.org and we will send those on to him. Some of the questions were quite personal and, and it might be more appropriate for Dr. Cesario to answer them than that way. So we thank you all for being with us. We hope to have you with us in November for our next medicine in our backyard. And I urge you all to be safe and to be responsible. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Adrian.